Hello and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 1 Core Vocabulary. My name is Leon Sultan. I'm an AP Human Geography teacher at Abraham Lincoln High School. And this is the what I think is the most important vocabulary terms from Chapter 1 of the Human Geography textbook, 10th edition, by uh, Foberg, Murphy, and Debley. And I'd like to thank the authors because I think it's an excellent textbook. So we're going to start actually with the last couple terms. Um, and then we'll go back to the to the first few. So the, the last couple terms are environmental determinism and possibilism. So the basic idea behind environmental determinism is that human societies are really determined close to 100% by their physical environments. Now in contrast to that belief, possibilism is the belief that physical environments play a part in shaping societies, but there are many other possibilities in how development occurs. So these two ideas are sort of at odds with each other. Environmental determinism was first. Uh, it was an idea that was created in the 1800s, and it was really created as a, um, a way to justify colonialism and justify mistreatment of people, um, especially in uh, areas that had been colonized by European countries. So environmental determinant determinism over time was largely discredited as a racist theory to justify uh, mistreatment of people from Europe over those in the rest of the world. And possibilism has really replaced it as the dominant theory, um, saying that really it's human decision making that affects culture much more than the environment, although the environment does play a factor. So the next term is called globalization, and this is at the beginning of the chapter, and this is defined as a set of processes that are increasing interactions, deepening relationships, and heightening interdependence without regard to country borders. So globalization is really a, a term that can be applied to every single chapter in the book, and it's really something we have to keep in mind. So the example that I'm going to give of globalization is the iPhone. So the iPhone is a great example of globalization because it's really, it is um, a demonstration of global interdependence. So the iPhone is designed primarily in um, Silicon Valley here in California and at the Apple labs and so they send the design patterns out into various places around Asia where small parts are manufactured and then all of those small parts are then shipped to one factory um, notably uh, recently Foxconn in southern China where it is the iPhones are then assembled after they're assembled they're then placed on these giant container ships. Container ships are very, very important for globalization because they are able to ship goods at low cost across great distances. So after the iPhones are shipped from the manufacturing or assembly plant in southern China, then they're shipped out to the all over the world where they are then bought and sold in um, the Apple stores. So we know this product is bought and sold all over the world. Uh, and it is a really, uh, it's, a, it's a way that interdependence is increased and um, heightens relationships and really puts people in touch all over the world, irregardless of boundaries. The next term is connectivity. Connectivity is defined as the direct linkage between one particular location and other locations in a network. So, which place has a higher level of connectivity? This village of rice terraces or this city? So obviously the city has a much higher level of connectivity, and it's not just about electricity and internet and telephone wires, which we can see the village lacks, but it's also about transportation. So this city likely has an international airport, it has roads connecting it, it has trains connecting it, it has um, highways, and most likely it has a port either in the city or very close by. The next two terms are cultural landscape and sequent occupants. So this is a picture that I took in Croatia a few summers ago, and this demonstrates both cultural landscape and sequent occupants. So the first thing that shows us sequent occupants are these pillars here, which were created by the Romans. Then we have a church, which is about a thousand years old and predates the schism that separated Christianity into the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. So it's a very, very old Christian church. And then we have another Catholic church, which demonstrates the, the current religion of the country, and that Catholic church is around 300 years old. And then finally, we have a modern-day cafe down here, which shows us um, sort of how people currently spend their time. So this shows us one, two, three, four different layers of the cultural landscape. The cultural landscape, again, being the reflection of the culture of that area on the physical landscape. So 
buildings, cafes, shops, etc., etc. Okay, next we have cartography. Cartography is the art and science of making maps, including data compilation, layout, and design. It's also concerned with the interpretation of mapped patterns. So it's everything to do with the creation and interpretation of maps. Next up is formal region. Formal region is defined as a type of region marked by a certain degree of homogeneity in one or more phenomena. It's also called uniform region or homogeneous region. So in other words, it has shared traits. A more precise and simple definition for formal region is a formal region has a shared cultural or physical trait. The picture down here is the example given in the book. It's a region in China with karst rock formations. You can see the beautiful rock formations and rivers. So that it's a region with a shared physical trait. Here are two examples of regions with shared cultural traits. The first map demonstrates the Spanish-speaking countries of the world. So that's a, a formal region with a shared physical or cultural trait. Here are the French-speaking countries of the world. Again, a shared cultural trait. A functional region is defined as uh, a region defined by a particular set of activities or interactions that occur within it. The examples given in the book are cities and the surrounding suburbs, for example, Chicago and all of the extensive suburbs, or Washington, D.C. and the extensive suburbs. So our example is going to be the Bay Area and the extensive suburbs and smaller cities that exist within it, like uh, San Francisco, San Jose, and then also Oakland, Hayward, Berkeley, Santa Rosa, etc. So the entire Bay Area is considered a functional region. Next up we have perceptual regions and these are intellectual constructs designed to help us understand the nature and distribution of phenomena in human geography. I like to think of these things as regions of the mind, right? Regions of the mind. They exist in our minds and here we have a map of perceptual regions of North America and the perceptual region of North America considered the South is really marked by the cultural landscape. So we can see a Baptist church here, which shows the dominant religion of the region, a Waffle House, which shows us sort of the types of foods, one of the major types of foods that are uh, eaten in the region, and then the actual physical landscape with these uh, nice old trees with Spanish moss and uh, leftover remnants of plantation architecture. Okay, the next turn is cultural hearth. Cultural hearth is a heartland or source area of uh, innovation center or place of origin of a major culture. So it's wherever a major culture or cultural innovation or idea started from. An example would be Buddhism. Buddhism um, started specifically at the place that the Buddha lived and taught, and that's a place in northern India. And from there, then it diffused all throughout Asia. So the cultural hearth of Buddhism is actually a place called Bodh Gaya, which is located in northern India. Another example would be for Islam. Islam's cultural hearth is Mecca. Okay, this is the city in which Muhammad lived and preached. Cultural diffusion is the expansion and adoption of a cultural element from its place of origin to a wider area. And this could be something as simple as blue jeans or something more complex like religion. Time distance decay describes what happens with cultural diffusion. As a culture or cultural element diffuses away from the hearth and is adapted, the idea diffuses less and less and less and less people adopt it the further away from the hearth that it travels. So there's less adoption the further away from the hearth. Now we're going to get into different types of cultural diffusion. So the first type is expansion diffusion and Islam is a, an example of uh, expansion diffusion because really what happens is you get a larger and larger source area to the point where the source area for Islam now is the entire Middle East, not just one city. So that's expansion diffusion. Buddhism is another example of expansion diffusion. The next type of cultural diffusion is contagious diffusion. And contagious diffusion spreads evenly out from the hearth um, to early adopters and then later adopters. And the amount of uh, adoption depends on how far away you are from the hearth. So an example of that is uh, with silly bands. And with silly bands, um, it's considered contagious diffusion because it spread evenly 
from the hearth. Okay, this is contrasted with hierarchical diffusion where the distance from the hearth is not as important as early adopters. So early adopters are people who adopt a specific trend or innovation regardless of how far they are from the hearth and then they spread it to other people. So an example of hierarchical diffusion would be Crocs footwear. So Crocs footwear are an example of hierarchical because they were adopted specifically by people who used them for boating and then they were adopted by the general public later. So you had early adoption and later adoption and thus hierarchical diffusion. Okay, the next type is called relocation diffusion, and this is a graphic that demonstrates relocation diffusion. So you have an original hearth, an original idea, and then people who have adopted that idea have relocated to a new place, and they have a relocated hearth. So people have taken the original idea, and they have moved to a new place, oftentimes a new country, far away, and they've taken with them an aspect of their culture, and then um, it diffuses in the new relocated hearth. So this type of diffusion uh, would be a, a good example of this would be quickly boba tea, or all types of boba tea uh, represented here by quickly, and that diffused um, from Taiwan to the United States. The next type is called stimulus diffusion, and that's when you have an original idea, and then it is spread to a new place, relocated, and it's adapted to fit the local context, and that's called stimulus diffusion. So you have your original idea, and then it's adapted to fit the local context and changed. So, for example, we have the Maharaja Mac and Vegetable uh, Burger with cheese, and that's McDonald's in India. So what they've done in India is they've taken the original idea of McDonald's, and then they've adapted it to fit the local context because people there in large part are vegetarian and uh, no, no one really eats beef who is a Hindu. Okay, the final term here is rescale, and rescale is the involvement of players at other scales to generate support for a position or an initiative. For example, the use of the internet to generate interest on a national or a global scale for a local position or initiative. So the picture here is the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, and that became a viral video sensation, which really did go from a local initiative to a really a global initiative. Another example would be ISIS. ISIS is a group that started really um, in uh, northern Iraq and uh, eastern Syria and this group then using uh, very uh, strategically using the internet spread and at this point they are now a global phenomenon. Okay, thanks for listening. That's the entire uh, lecture. Please subscribe to the channel and leave comments below.